Good afternoon, everyone. I realize that uh, uh, I stand before our closing comments and probably is a, a really good dinner, so we'll, we'll keep the trains moving. But I'm really proud to be here and, and, and humbled and really look forward to a discussion. What you just saw was basically the top-down approach of people of, of great stature and leadership. Now we're going to hear from a number of individuals who work on the ground floor in specific communities and how we bring that forth. So I'd like to call to the stage and, and to join me up here, uh, Marla Bilonik. She's the president and CEO of the National Association for Latino Community Asset Builders. Also, Arturo Casares, CEO of the Latino Business, Business Action Network. Um, Teresa Miranda, Vice President of Prestamo CDF5. And also joining us is Brian Kennedy Jr. He is the Entrepreneur Ecosystem Director at Ampac Business Capital. Pleasure to be here with you. Thank you. So, uh, Please take some time to look at their bios, They're really impressive backgrounds and, and people that have you know, spent lots of time in their particular communities addressing the specific challenges that we are facing uh, in terms of scaling Latino businesses, providing access to capital and the like. I'd like to start with just a couple of comments and then I'm going to uh, work with our panel to, to help address some of the uh, issues that we still are uncovering. Uh, I'll also remind everyone that if you have a question, write it down on the note card. And for those of you joining us online, uh, please provide that in the, in the chat uh, uh, app so that we can take your questions as well. I'll start by saying that, um, you know, as, 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 as the day has passed, I'm reminded of what I tell my students. I, I also teach entrepreneurship at a, at a Hispanic serving institution. And I always thought that you could not teach someone how to be an entrepreneur. You were either born with it or you weren't. And the truth is, especially for those of us that are parents, we teach behavior and we aspire that that behavior is reflective of the best uh, attributes and characteristics that our children can embody. Likewise, we can teach entrepreneurship. We do it all the time. What we cannot teach is whether to take the risk or not. There are two types of entrepreneurs, those that go after an opportunity and those that don't have a choice because opportunities were taken away. So with that in mind, let's talk to people who have to deal with entrepreneurs, right? That are coming both, hey, I have an opportunity and I, I wanna know how to scale it, or I just lost my job and now I need to figure out what to do, right? So uh, we'll start with, with Marla. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the organization you're with and uh, uh, specifically answer one question. Why does an entrepreneur, Latino entrepreneur, trust your organization? Okay, so I'm in a little bit of a different boat than my partners here on stage, so I'll kind of explain how my orientation pertains to this panel, but I am representing the National Association for Latino Community Asset Builders. We are a CDFI in our own right, a membership organization that is working to advance economic mobility for Latinos across the U.S. by supporting our member organizations that are community-based organizations and CDFIs located in these cities, located in the cities that are involved in today's uh, experience. Um, and so within our network, I would say about half of our members are working with entrepreneurs either as technical assistance providers, as small business lenders that are not certified as CDFIs, and then also as CDFIs. We have about 50 CDFI members within, so about a third of our membership are certified CDFIs. And um, the other side of my experience is that prior to coming to NALCAB, I was leading a member organization that was a community-based CDFI based here in Washington, D.C. called the Latino Economic Development Center. Um, and so through the pandemic, I was, you know, just rolled up my sleeves and in the midst of, of that experience. So I'm going to be speaking to kind of both of those experiences. Um, but in terms of why a CDFI or why an entrepreneur should trust a, a community-based organization or a CDFI, I think 
um, you know, the genesis of CDFIs is to provide an alternative to the commercial banking system. And, you know, it, there are so many nuances to working in a CDFI. I don't like to use the term handholding because I think that just sounds condescending. It's, you know, kind of like a paternalistic, like you're holding your hand, the hand of a child through a process. But I think really what it is, is bridging the gap between you know, systems that people may not be familiar with, particularly more recently arrived immigrants. Um, I know when I was working in, at the community level, you know, that was a challenge. It's not, it, it has nothing to do with um, chutzpah or energy or drive. It's just, you know, a completely new system that you need to be, you know, educated on or, or, or taught about. And then once you learn that, you can, you know, take the necessary steps. But I just think the, the being rooted in the community the cultural competency, the linguistic competency, all of that creates a path for trust and for a relationship that is much deep, deeper than a commercial bank would be able to provide. Wonderful. Arturo, some thoughts on that? Yeah, so I'm from Latino Business Action Network. A little bit about that first, and then I'll address that comment, but uh, very aligned in terms of how to build trust. Um, but, but what we do is we're a nonprofit and our goal is to strengthen the U.S. economy by empowering Latino entrepreneurship. And we do that by leveraging the best out of Stanford Graduate School of Business and applying it to the Latino opportunity across our country. So there's three pillars to that. One is foundational research that we're doing at Stanford on Latino businesses. We, ha we now have the largest database where we, ha we have now six years of doing this research and producing a report every year at Stanford that gets disseminated on the state of Latino entrepreneurship. The second area is we recruit from across the country Latino business owners, bring them to Stanford, and we train them on how to scale their business. And the whole focus is how to grow your business from wherever you are now to, to a much bigger size. And while they're with us, we connect them with mentors as well as capital providers and the third and final area of focus is building an ecosystem based on these alumni of our program, which now number about 900, and every year it grows with capital providers and with corporations for access to corporate contracts. So we're trying to build this national ecosystem around Latino entrepreneurship. You know, in terms of trust for us, even though we're a national organization and we literally now have thousands of people in our ecosystem, it's about relationships. And we do invest a lot of time in building those relationships with the entrepreneurs when they come, as well as with all the partners that are part of our ecosystem, including the capital providers. And we have to run the gamut of all types of capital providers, from CDFIs, which we partner with a lot, banks, um, VCs, angels, um, because our entrepreneurs are going to need all different types of capital. But th that's kind of, in a, in, a, in a nutshell, it's building a relationship, but always with this concept of a national ecosystem that's going to empower the American economy. Wonderful. Teresa? Uh, I'm talking earlier today, a lot of individuals don't know who Prestamos is. Um, so Prestamos is a subsidiary of Chicanos por la Causa, which we just celebrate our 52nd uh, anniversary. And part of CPLC is to empower uh, communities, and we do it by social service, economic development, um, and part of it is also our, in a, under the economic development is our, our pillar, which is Prestamos. And we've been doing lending for over 30 years. Um, and you know, we're definitely committed to our community. Uh, we hire within our community. You know, we're a, a lender that is focused on the Latino community. So all our staff speak Spanish from beginning to end uh, because we, it's important that whether you're doing the origination or you're doing the servicing, you know, that you speak Spanish. Um, and we are able to commit, uh, communicate with our, with our uh, small businesses in the language that they prefer. Um, you know, I'll, I'll fast forward because we've been doing lending for 30 years is that in the last 18 months, we definitely uh, felt that we are truly committed to our community, not only from the business side, but also from partners. You know, partners reaching out to us to how is it that we're gonna be able to assist our communities, right? This is on the beginning of the pandemic back in March. They didn't have the answers, we didn't have the answers, but they were looking at us to what was gonna be the steps to help the community, right? Uh, this is before our PPP uh, was rolled out. 
and we basically rolled up our sleeves and said, you know, how is it that we're going to be able to do that? What a lot of people and a lot of business owners needed was, you know, just someone that they can say what's going to happen. We didn't have the answers, but we listened to them and we provided to find the resources based on what we were hearing from those businesses that, that, that they needed. You know, we thought that, okay, here's a loan, but they didn't need a loan, right? They just needed to know what's going to happen. And this pandemic not only impacted, you know, the financial, but also their health, right? You know, businesses, uh, their employees, their families, and, and how we had that compassion to listen to them and help them and guide them to the next level. So, you know, being able to navigate, you know, the system for the small businesses, right? And building that trust. If you're telling me that's what I need to do, that's what I'm going to do. If I need to pivot my business, if I need to, you know, uh, apply for the PPP, not knowing what the PPP was, right? They trusted us, right? Uh, we were sending forms and we were saying, okay, this is what you need to do, or so-and-so asked me to give you a call and tell me what I need to do. That's what we have built in the past 52 years in our community and continue to do that by expanding to other markets. Awesome. Brian. Yeah, I guess it's my turn. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Great to be here. I am with Ampac Business Capital. We are a nonprofit SBA CDC and CDFI in the Inland Empire region of Southern California. We are one of the only CDFI CDCs in the region. And so similar, um, Teresa, we become a partner very naturally because we are kind of the one-stop shop when folks are hearing about programs coming out but don't know where to turn. We are able to be that first line of response. And it, it's, a, it's a real honor to be able to be a resource for entrepreneurs, not only as a capital provider, but as a partner network. Because we've been intentional. We're a younger organization. We've been around about 14 years now. But we've been really intentional about partnering with all the major city and state institutions that we can get our hands on, the SBDCs, the SCORES, the Women Business Centers. So as folks are getting into those pipelines, they know our name as well. So we've established trust in that way, which has been really beneficial. So let me, let me add a little context because uh, I find it fascinating that the elements that each person brought forth of their organization certainly deals with trust, but it also deals with something that uh, everybody might have trouble with, which is how do I gain a foothold in the midst of uncertainty? And when you have trusted organizations in a community, being in uncertain situations becomes easier, right? Because that trust becomes that glue, right? So now I'm gonna get a little dark on you guys, and I'd like for you to tell me, you don't have to go into great detail, but tell me when you were working on something in your community that perhaps didn't go as planned, and how you went back to the community to re-engage it, right? Because, and, and I bring this up because, you know, during the pandemic, one of the things that we've learned in our community that is that a lot of, uh, a lot of our, our, our small businesses, particularly Latino businesses, were not prepared, and we could not help them because the data was in there, or their paperwork was in there, or you know the, the mortality rate for that business was be was going to be high. So now we have an opportunity to reset. So share an example how you engage in your community to reset, particularly to help uh, Latino or underrepresented uh, entrepreneurs. And we'll go reverse order this time. All right. <laughs> so I'll, I'll kick off with the PPP program. The first round, we were only able to serve about 172 businesses. And the biggest barrier we saw for folks that would apply is that they didn't have their ducks in a row and they didn't know who to turn to to get that support. And so the second round, we were able to up our numbers to 532 businesses because we brought in our partners, the SBDCs, the scores, to be on the webinars to answer the questions and to connect people individually so they could go get the one-on-one -on -one coaching, get their ducks in a row and come apply again. And that was with the PPP program. The other area where we're really trying to make a better comeback is with the SBA 504 program. We're really trying to target bridging the racial wealth gap through commercial real estate. And a lot of our underserved communities are not able to access that program. A lot of the times because of the down payment component. And so we're trying to circle back now with impact investors to provide a commercial down payment assistance program so we can be even more intentional. Hey, you don't need the full 20% down. 
you can just do 10. And so we're trying to circle back to give them even more opportunities to really take advantage of these programs that can really pivot their business and, and their wealth. Excellent. Teresa, an example of how you know, 30 year old organization, some of the lessons learned that, that we can take away with the number of the communities represented here. I, I think we, we learn every day. Um, I, I think the pandemic didn't, didn't allow us to really sit down and see what was gonna be the approach. You know, um, when I reached out to my legal department, they said, Teresa, we're building, we're flying. As we're building, we're just hoping for a safe landing. So whatever you need to do, go ahead and do that. Uh, I think, um, you know, going back to the first round of the PPPs, you know, we definitely were disappointed because I know there was much more that we could have been able to do, uh, but we just didn't have the time and all the resources. So we, we definitely hired more people for the second round. We kind of had an idea, kind of had an idea of what we needed to do because it kept changing. Um, so we needed to be looking out for those changes. But we hire people, and we hire people within our organization. Over the 1,200 employees that we have, we recruited to work for our department. People that departments, maybe they weren't as busy, or maybe um, they just had extra time to give. So we were working around the clock, so those folks were able to help us to be able to assist more businesses. And again, it wasn't just anyone. It was someone that had a sense of the work that was gonna be involved. You know, how are we gonna be able to connect, be patient, explain over and over again, be able to use your cell phone so they can take a picture of the driver's license and so we can upload it to the system. They didn't have the technology, right? They didn't have the computer, but we were able to do it that way. So again, what are the lessons that we learned on the first one, or the challenges that we had on the first round, that we're able to apply it to the second one? Um, and then also the partnerships, right? We talk about partnerships, you know, being able to partner up with a technology company to be able to reach those Schedule C's individuals, those you know, hair salons, the Uber drivers, the landscapers, and being able to uh, be number three, not only in dollars, but in volume, being able to deploy over $7.6 billion, right? Um, and that took an army of folks you know, to be able to do that, and we continue to have folks to do the servicing. Now, we're committed to all those businesses that we serve through the PPP, because now they're looking at us, people that didn't know who Prestamos was, to continue to help them. Um, and we continue to build those relationships because we just didn't give you the PPP. What's the next step for them? You know, right. what's to follow? Um, could it be capital, could it be the technical assistance, could it be the mentoring, right? You know, Marla says she doesn't like to use a whole tending, and absolutely right, we mentor, right. right? We're the mentor for your business. You know, we are the mentors not only for you, but also for your employees as well. Um, so the way you perform, that's how your, that's your job security. So, you know, it's not only about the owner, but it's also for you as well. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, I think for us, you know, similar, we, we had an interesting ride with PPP, I think like mm -hmm. everyone did. We, we lucked out, I think, in a sense, because we were able to react quick enough with our network, and we had an 82% success rate on that first round, it, but because we saw people failing, and then they were communicating amongst themselves, sharing that failure, mm -hmm. and then we got to figure out how to solve that. But um, Idol was then another mess. It just mm -hmm. like brought everyone back down and we had to scramble. And so, and we use our connections with the SBA and others to say, hey, this must be a bigger issue. Because if our network, which is now very sophisticated, is tripping over this thing, then you're probably having a lot of people trip over it, right? And so then they did a relaunch eventually, right? But one of the, the learnings for us is to try to be more, um, more thoughtful about how to help others make the systemic changes that need to happen so that you know, there's real change and real access happening across the board, not just because we went through a successful fire drill and solved it, um, but we continue to do fire drills. So you know, we have countless examples of our network helping itself where um, one, woman, her business, she was about to shut it down because when the pandemic hit, she couldn't transact. So another alumni from our program connected with her and built out uh, overnight like an online presence and she's now bigger than she was before. And we have several examples like that of the network helping itself react to these crises. And so our, our goal now is to try to figure out how can we take some of these examples and try to make them more systemic. Because again, not that everything is scalable, but 
some of these things are hitting our community harder than they should. And we wanna be better as an organization to try to help those other parts of the ecosystem do a better job or address these blind spots. Excellent. Uh, so I'll just say, I'll give a couple of examples. One, um, and I don't know that this is exactly sort of a mistake, but it's something that was conceptualized in one way and then during COVID was repurposed into a different way. So um, now CAB has a loan fund and I think there was someone from Wells Fargo here, so who, whomever is representing Wells, thank you, you capitalized this um, loan fund for uh, now CAB called the Exceso Fund. And that fund is intended and will ultimately go back to this purpose, but it was intended to help our member organizations do larger deals than they're typically able to do. So those organizations that are kind of hovering at the 50,000 and below, if they come across a deal that's you know, for 250,000, 500,000 that they you know, are totally interested in supporting but just not prepared either from a capital standpoint or a capacity standpoint to do, um, this fund would kind of step in and partner there. Well, during COVID, a lot of our members, including the one that I was leading at the time, um, you know, were ready and willing and engaged and wanting to offer PPP, but the jump from you know, the desire and having that kind of available capital are two different things. And so what we ended up doing at NALCAB was repurposing that loan fund um, to be able to capitalize members' ability to do PPP. And so we ultimately lent out $12 million to our member organizations to be able to do PPP lending, um, you know, which really, I know in the case of the organization that I had been leading, we like did a year's worth of volume in like four months or something like that. You know, so you really needed to be able to support organizations with that extra liquidity because it's just, you know, who would have thought that, that, that we would be in that position? So um, I thought that that was sort of a great example of shifting purpose and kind of just going with the flow and doing what needed to be done, which I think everyone on this panel certainly did and is continuing to do. And then the second thing, just to echo Teresa's comments, is um, when I was working at, uh, in a community-based organization, we did repurpose staff. So staff that you know, were TA providers were all of a sudden lending, lending. And there's actually someone from the LADC staff sitting right here in front of me. So she can attest to the fact that she you know, was typically a technical assistance provider, but then kind of became a loan officer overnight by default. So, um, you know, we were lucky to have that extra capacity just in terms of human capital, but, um, you know, and we could probably have an entire panel about how challenging the PPP kind of ramp up was, but we can save that for another time. And I'm not just saying that because Mark has left the room, but, you know, we can just uh, do it another, another time. Yeah. But, but I think it's important to see that, you know, cer certainly when you have externalities, right, not just the pandemic, but the externality of access to capital, the importance of it, mm -hmm. what needs to happen is at the ground level, yeah. right? Those organizations that help and assist entrepreneurs also need help and assistance in many ways uh, to be prepared, right? Absolutely. And uh, we haven't even touched on, like, the need of technology mm -hmm. or, you know, um, you know, uh, how prepared the entrepreneur themselves might be or whatnot. I mean, we're, we're essentially talking of the fact that you need partners, you need to collaborate, mm -hmm. right? You need a game plan, you need to react, right? And in, in the spirit of that, uh, and open to all four of you, uh, what, if you had a magic wand today, and you say, I would like to change this particular aspect of how I provide the services I provide to my community, what would it be? I'll jump in first because this is what we're trying to build and why I'm so grateful to be here amongst all of you moving in the same direction. I wish that I could wave a magic wand and have a fully implemented and extremely effective entrepreneur ecosystem built out mm -hmm. so that similar, similar to how Arturo was saying that the network is able to mentor each other. Mm. I wish that was national. And the partners were already connected and working together. Mm. If I had a magic wand, that's what I would do. But it's going to take a little longer now. OK. No, I love it. You know, you're essentially, uh, you want the full continuum of a network or an ecosystem available so that when someone at this stage needs help, there's someone who's already been through it. They can, they can, they can draw on with the trust to be able to accelerate their learning. Exactly. Wonderful. 
I, I'll, I'll use that uh, to start. Um, I think there's a lot of energy um, within the communities, but I think we kind of miss each other. Mm. Uh, we, we don't have that direct communication. Um, and even when there's programs out there, um, it's, we're not working side by side. Um, so maybe there's, there should be more uh, a process put together. You have a technical provider to our lender, right? And then even going back because they continue to need that assistance. When I started back with, uh, with Prestamos, um, we were just a lender and we relied on the SBDC scores, you know, to be able to provide the technical assistance. Mm -hmm. um, we found out that, you know, it was a mess because they needed to go back to the next, the next client or the next member, uh, that next business owner. So they didn't have the ability to continue to mentor that business. Now we've kind of been changing that by actually bringing that in-house and be able to say we, we're protecting our own investment. But in reality, right, we're protecting that business owner to be, and we want him to be successful. If we had more partnerships within our communities, right, to be able to say, let's not duplicate the efforts and how we can actually be, become and build stronger communities. Um, that would be great. The other thing that I, and I will use my one, that was yours, um, was the, you know, within programs, right? It, it seems that every time we're, we're spending so much time and energy applying for that funding um, and, and then reinventing it internally. I mean, as much as we want to say this is what we do and this is what we want it, they always put these conditions, these barriers, right, that we have to put up systems in place in order to do that reporting. You know, we need to retrain our staff to be able to, you know, pick up on those items that we need to report back. Typically, they're the same matrix, but again, we have to break it down, and, and, and that takes time and takes energy, um, either to apply and to implement as well. So that's what some of the things that I think I would love to change. Yeah, so I would agree with the first two. I think we're not done building the ecosystem, so we're focused, that's our, our big focus right now, is how to make that ecosystem much more powerful. But then also in terms of, the, we're a nonprofit, so we're always asking for money from a lot of different corporations and, and foundations. And, and it is a burden to have to spend so much energy on that, but also then on the follow-up that's required because then they need the impact reports, all that kind of stuff. Um, but in terms of my magic wand, <laughs> where I would use it, um, you know, p part of what we did with our data in the beginning was just to try to show even to ourselves who we are and to show the world this is who we are. Give the example of these are Latinos. Whatever preconceived notions any of us might have about who we are or, or the world, the, the, the facts speak for themselves, that we are a strong and ascending population. Then the other thing that we focused on with the scaling program was now how do we get involved on the ground showing people how to grow their businesses, which is what we do with the scaling program and all that. Um, but now uh, our focus is more on trying to help with the systems that we're touching to try to make big changes happen. You have our data influence policymakers and everyone else have our ecosystem go out there and, and try to change sort of how Latinos are, are moving and dealing in the world. Not just with the, when it comes to business, but in, in all areas. I mean, business is gonna be the key driver, I think, for a lot of people. So my magic wand would be, if I could change in people's minds, not everyone, but still there's a, a perception out there for many gatekeepers that we come across that Latinos are high risk. That's a fallacy. Mm -hmm. That is such a fallacy. We're, we're the lowest risk population mm -hmm. because of our history, because of who we are, because we're overcoming. A and we can see all sides of this thing. We, we represent the epitome of America. Mm -hmm. We're the last people that need to justify who we are or that we're a good investment. But yet, that's what I spent all my time on. And so if I could, I, I would find a way to change those mindsets for every gatekeeper out there. Uh, well, that's a very challenging one to follow, but I, I would just say um, from my point of view, because our membership is so expansive, 
I can really have this bird's eye view on where there is, you know, a very well established and developed small business ecosystem. And then other communities, rural communities, for example, but you know, other communities as well, where particularly Latino facing organizations that serve small businesses, either with technical assistance or lending services, are few and far between. And you know, if I could wave a magic wand, it would be sort of a more equitable distribution of, of these resources because it's, you know, entrepreneurship is everywhere and it's such an opportunity. Um, for so many in our community to advance beyond what a traditional job could offer. And so I, I just wish that there would be a way to magically just create these you know, vibrant and, and strong ecosystems you know, across the US. Um, and then you know, for what role we could potentially play in that, I think to echo the first comments you know, around mentorship and, and um, like a mentor protege type of relationship between members that in our membership that are sort of all over the spectrum we have in our membership group membership groups like CPLC like Lift Fund who's represented here with Janie um, like Opportunity Fund um, in San Francisco and so we have like that extreme you know level of capacity and and resources and, and ability you know matched with you know a group that may have a three-person staff that just decided they're going to do small business lending and they have a hundred thousand dollars to lend you know so how do we bring these groups together so that they can really learn from one another and there is a science to it because it has to be people in totally different markets it has to be people who don't feel you know threatened it has to be people with time we've even you know come up with a, an idea around compensating you know those more advanced members to mm -hmm. mentor um, you know groups that are are kind of at the beginning of their journey just because it you know it's really challenging especially if you're really successful to have the time to do that so that would be my poof moment. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I love it because, you know, some of our uh, attendees here are representing Latino prevalent communities. They're about to roll out their sleeves. And in El Paso, we have the good fortune of, 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 uh, of a leg up, you know, six mm -hmm. months of working with data partners, community partners, and under the, the tutelage of the, of the Aspen uh, Institute's program, mm -hmm. specifically to help Create that right, mm -hmm. so we, we got a six months magic wand, if you will, yeah, to, to, to accelerate that. So, you're about to move cities, each of you. Mm. You're about to move cities. The new city that you're going to be at needs your help. How will you go about inspiring, moving, uh, engaging people so that Latino community there has better access to capital? so that they have the resources they need. I mean, that, that is your, your new job, right? You're moving from the comfort zone of your existing uh, community to a new one. Because the reality is that at some point, we're gonna have to work cross cities, yeah. and we're gonna have to work cross you know, boundaries so that every community becomes a partner, a client, right, a vendor, uh, and a success story. So what would you do if you moved to a new location? I'll, I'll take this one. <laughs> um, we keep expanding. Um, you know, for the first, I would say, 20, 20 plus years, we were just in Arizona, and then we back expanded to Nevada. And since then, we've done Texas, you know, New Mexico, LA. And I think that the key is really not coming in and saying, this is what I'm gonna do, but engaging the community, you know, engaging folks that are there and hearing from them what is the need. Right? and hiring within those communities. Not relocating folks to do the work, but let me hire you because you know the community, you know the needs. And, but before we do anything, tell me what we need to do here. Right? I have an idea, but tell me if I'm right. And then let's use your ideas. Let's bring in your folks that you trust so that they can trust us as an organization to be able to build. Um, but I think that's kind of being our key success is to go and listen. I've, I've been on the road this week, and that's ex doing exactly that. You know, mm -hmm. what is it that you need? You know, what, how is it that we can help you? Not how we can help us as an organization, but how can we help you? And it's about helping the uh, community and, and helping the businesses or any other sub type of services that we're trying to assist in those communities. It's not about CPLC or Presamos, but it's about the community. Excellent. Go ahead. I have a short answer. I, I would just bring to the table the economic data of the positive impact that 
supporting Latino-owned businesses has. That's a completely neutral point. It doesn't matter about politics that people may have or not have. It's just you know facts. And so that is really sort of what I would lead with if I were in that situation. I think it's you know um, not only because the organization that I'm currently in, which I guess you're saying I wouldn't necessarily be in if I was moving to a different city, but all this to say, like that is sort of what we lead with because it's completely neutral and it's obvious and it's true. So. You know, um, one of our hashtags is Latino Economic Engine, and so that would be kind of the train that I would ride on into my new city. <laughs> I love it. I will, I'll jump in and I will piggyback off of Teresa. Am I saying that right? Correct. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I was always told you got two ears and one mouth for a reason, so listening is your biggest strength. But I am taking a page out of Aspen's book. Finding the anchor is a big piece of that impact. And we've talked about so many anchors during the course of this summit. The thinking about higher education, right? Thinking about the colleges that are making that, the community colleges that are making that impact. And then who's the anchor? Is it the city? Is it a community action organization? Bringing those folks together first to listen to them would be my first point of action because they see the needs because they've been there and filling the needs. And if you can start from there, you can develop a plan to even lessen better to the actual community itself. But I would say that would be my starting point, coupled with some data to really give people <laughs> an unbiased opinion. Good deal. Um, let's pivot a little bit and now talk about technology, very specific to, generally speaking, your fields. Um, FinTech, right? made up of two very scary words in, in any context, <laughs> finance and technology, right? We know that it's here to stay. By some measure, I think it was, a, it might have been a McKinsey report that stated that because of the pandemic, adoption of technology accelerated by 10 years, right? So if you weren't ready, uh-oh, right? Uh, that's, that, that train left the station. Every business, Latino or otherwise, that interacts with a lender, a community organization, uh, CDFI, a bank, needs to understand that. Do you have a strategy or a recommendation to help uh, Latino-owned businesses really incorporate into that and, uh, and not be left behind? I would, I would love to kind of jump in first. Mm -hmm. we, we really are trying to get to where we can be FinTech with a touch. And mm -hmm. FinTech is scary because there's not really a person that you can connect with. There's not someone who can really give you guidance. But if you can bridge that part of the gap, it's a little bit more encouraging to be a part of the finance and technology world. We have to be a part of the technology world. We have to advance in the financial side of it. But if we had a guiding force, how much easier does it make it? Yeah. And so that's where, that's where we're trying to really be impactful, yeah. bridging that divide. I, I mean, Brian, I mean, and play devil's advocate right here because we just spent the last 40 minutes talking about trust and community and stuff and now now you want to take that trust and warm and fuzzy stuff away and, and give me an app right, right. And, and that is one big challenge in our community whether whether in finance or otherwise so how do we you know how do we unpack that right that is the biggest question and I'll, I'll, I'll give a, a thought I don't have an answer I wish I did but the one way that we're seeing, we recently rolled out a mobile app, and one way that we're seeing we can still engage folks is don't forget to call them. Don't forget to send them a letter in the mail. Keep the technology, but give them a personal touch too so that they feel more engaged with the technology. And we found that's had some success for us. Excellent. I, I think that's 100%. I think it's not just 100% technology. It's the additional step after um, we know that, you know, a uh, few years back, we're in conferences, we kept hearing about those Harmony lenders online. And, you know, they were kind of leading, you know, uh, because they were just using the technology. Um, and then it's like, how do we get in front of those? But we still wanted to do the, 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 the direct connection, you know, the, the being able to do the, the touch, right, with the client, and we didn't want to go there. Now we have to, right? We definitely were there. You know, there was no turning back. We're definitely there. But, you know, let's not forget to put someone behind, you know, that lead that comes in through, you know, through the R-Line platform 
to be able to call him back, and that's what we have. You know, everybody gets a call back, not just an automatic, you know, here's an email, you know, this is how it goes, but we try to make the attempt to connect with them. Some people just don't want to, you know, they don't want the calls, right? I'm too busy, I'll, I'll, I'll do it, but you know, just leave me alone and we'll respect that. And, but you know, definitely let's not forget that you know, they're looking for someone to connect with them. Yeah, uh, so our experience with, with that, it was during the pandemic when it was, you know, everything was out of control, companies were desperate. Sometimes it was faster to connect them with sort of these payment processing um, places to get the PPP process, right? And so even if we had to be on the phone with the entrepreneur to walk them through how to do it, that was faster for us to do that than sometimes leveraging our relationships that we might have had with a financial services institution. But um, I do think it's here to stay. Things like anything that could be done to simplify the processing of paperwork, it, that has to be done. And the reason I think why it's sometimes hard for our community or any community is because a lot of these systems are not easy to use. They're very complex, whether it's the SBA system where you're going through or a bank's or anyone else's. And what I find, I guess, optimistic is that I think all of these organizations are now looking at that, realizing that customers are going to be accessing them in that way and now really rethinking how do they do that. And I'm hopeful that much better systems will come out of it so that it becomes easier. Right now, it's hard to even imagine there's no fintech. You have to go get your business financed. It's, that's not easy to do. So the, the, the bar is actually quite low for fintech, right? <laughs> because you just have to be better than that. Yeah. And, and that, that is not an easy thing to do. But I think the pandemic pushed so much onto that that now those organizations that were doing some fintech or automated some of that are now realizing that what they have is not sufficient. And so they're going back and retooling. And I think there's gonna be real business opportunities for people to come in. And we have several of our entrepreneurs who are in the fintech space and looking at it as an, op an opportunity for them to figure out how to, to, to solve that problem better. But yeah, I think it's gonna be big um, for our community. Um, the other thing that we see with, I don't know if it would classify as fintech, but this crowdsourcing, mm -hmm. that too, I think, if for like venture type organizations, I was surprised there's companies that are part of our ecosystem, our network, and they're raising one to two million dollars using these platforms, mm -hmm. right? Like right now as we speak. Mm -hmm. And so what I have them doing is we're learning from them and we're having them communicate amongst themselves, the ones that are doing it, and then to tell us what the experience is so that we could then disseminate that to everyone. And obviously get involved if we think that there's a role for us to play in helping to facilitate this. Um, but yeah, I think there's gonna be a lot of changes happening in this whole space. I can give a super quick answer because I know okay. we're headed into Q&A, but I would just say, I think small business facing technical assistance providers need to be willing to include technology training as one of the elements of what they do, whether it's sort of implicit, like sitting you know, on the phone walking someone through a process or you know, actually having training courses or a computer lab or whatever that might be. And then I think for more national organizations like mine, I think we really have a role at the policy level around uh, advocating for broadband access and, and sort of the bigger picture in terms of how people can engage. So that would be my two cents. Excellent, excellent. I've got a couple of really good questions that have been submitted by folks. I'm going to start with those, okay? And feel free to jump in and, and provide a response. The heart of a community-based community organization, or the heart of community-based organizations are the people that work in them. How can we recruit, educate, and prepare future community service providers? I would love to jump in first on that. I'm sorry, I, I'm so excited about this stuff, <laughs> if you all can't tell. But it goes back to those anchors, right? We talk about higher education, we talk about community, we have the pipelines, but how much are we working with them? Do we have internships from our universities working with us at our CDFI, seeing how the loan process works, preparing them to come into the field? And so that's one thing that we're trying to be intentional about. Use the resources there to prepare that next generation. We have a scholarship program 
and we, we bring in a lot of folks uh, as a trade-off to do volunteer work or do their hours. And we end up hiring because they end up loving our work um, through the PPP process of how we were recruiting from internally. A lot of the folks decided as we opened permanent positions to transfer to our division because they were just behind the scenes. So now they're working in front and now they love the work. Now they really feel connected to the community. So that was, you know, again, how do we put people in the right places? Because now they have that passion. And I think that's what really has made CPLC a successful organization, being able to recruit and to mentor through some of our other programs that we have through the educational program, um, you know, some of our domestic violence programs uh, that they feel that they've actually, now they want to give back. So that's been one of our successes as well. That's great. Yeah, so for us, um, I think we're a great place to work. It seem, people seem to be <laughs> enjoying it uh, quite a bit. They, they can see like the impact that they're having. It. And, and, you know, the mission is important for us, right? So everyone in the organization is super committed to, to that. But um, my focus right now is to make sure that we always have sufficient funding that they could be paid competitively, right? Because there, we shouldn't make people that are doing community work um, value them any less. I mean, they should probably be valued the most in any community, more than um, if in, you know, we're in, in Silicon Valley, so we have to compete against all of the tech companies yeah. like Google and Facebook and all of that. And there should be no one working for us should be compensated any less than anyone else. In fact, they probably deserve to be paid more for that. I mean, they literally are doing, quote unquote, God's work, wow. in, in my opinion, right? And so that's my focus. And, and I do think that we're close to getting there in terms of addressing that issue. I, I would just add, um, at NALCAB we have a program that's been going on for over a decade that's a fellowship, a competitive fellowship for emerging leaders in this field. It's exclusive to Latino leaders and we've had an incredible track record. You know, folks who participated 10 years ago are now the executive director of their organization that they were, you know, a frontline staff person when they attended. So it's called the Pete Garcia Fellowship. We actually, the person from LADC that's here is a, is a graduate. And then I would also just put a plug in for Aspen's fellowships that I, I am a personal graduate of and that was very important to my career um, and so you know I, I think you know where you can get groups of of young energetic people um, mine was a long time ago when I was young so I'll just put that out there <laughs> but I think you know just really cultivating and then I also think the the work that we do so few people know about it you know I mean how many of us have been at a dinner party explaining what we do ad nauseum because people just don't know that this industry exists so I think part of it is an awareness campaign Excellent, excellent. The previous panel, in the previous panel, Bruce said uh, we need to work with, um, oh, I'm sorry, get, uh, yeah, we need to work with businesses one on one. Uh, if a funder asks how many businesses you are helping and you say 10, uh, they want to scale that. What is your answer? I think that's very typical, right? They just want to say we, we only helped a small number of clients. So I, I think one of the things that we've got around is by having multiple programs okay. and being able to say, well, you know, each program allows you to have five hours of one-on-one -on -one technical assistance or coaching. So we're going to spread you through different programs. Um, if you are relying only on one program, um, it's probably not going to work or you're going to have to do a lot of explaining to your funders why and then actually be able to give the impact right, you know, what with the outcomes. Uh, because it's really hard to say five hours of technical assistance is going to create a huge impact. Mm -hmm. But when you have right. multiple programs, it seems to work uh, because now you're able to report in the different programs and they all get to get the benefit of a, a great success story at the end. Yep. One of our, I don't know how successful we've been, but the, found, the funders, our sponsors have stayed with us, so maybe they bought it, but um, we believe it, right? So um, we, we, we are a focused program in the one sense. We research all Latino businesses, literally thousands, but we don't have a direct relationship with those companies. But we, we do do research that every year we go back to literally thousands of Latino companies across the country 
and we produce a research report. For our, our scaling program, that is very focused, and, and we're doing about 150 Latino, Latina entrepreneurs every year, and now there are about 900 in our ecosystem. So that's, for some, kind of a limited, you know, uh, our, our great big sponsors in the beginning, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, others will, will look at that and say, yeah, but, you know, there's thousands of companies out there, <laughs> and you're touching these 900. Um, th uh, our way of thinking about that, even when they're with us on day one of our program, is we have them try to think about their roles as change agents. Do business with each other, find business for each other is the mantra. And so each one of these 900 companies is touching so many others. And if you're a Latina or Latino business owner, it's much more likely that you are employing other Latinos or Latinas. It's much more likely that you're buying from other Latino or Latinas and selling to other Latino and Latinas. So you're impacting this community much more than just the 900 that we currently touch in a very direct way. That's really important because it has this replicative effect, if you will. Um, this next question uh, could potentially just require a short answer. Uh, and and it, it, it might not, we'll see. But as a follow-up to the earlier panel, uh, do your loan uh, products or programs require citizenship or U.S. residency? If so, could you commit to expand your services to serve the undocumented community, uh, provide uh, ITI eating loans? We do provide uh, okay. capital to undocumented. I, we do have programs that obviously, you know, for example, an SBA program, we cannot fund them under the SBA program, but we do have unrestricted dollars that we raise that are able to provide that. For me personally, I don't think a, an undocumented is either higher or lower risk. Um, I, I think those business owners um, appreciate it and they pay us even better um, because they feel that, every, you know, they knocked on so many doors, they said no, and now they found the door that said yes, that they're not gonna burn that bridge, right? They're not going to fail, they're not going to default even if they have to go and get another job to keep making their payments as they're still trying to keep their business alive, they'll continue to make those payments. Um, we have very few modifications, deferments when it comes to the Latino uh, portfolio. Uh, it's so we continue to make those loans and every time we have a new community member or board member, we have to educate them as to why, you know, and then kind of, this is the history of a Latino portfolio. They pay us back. Yeah, to, to, to some comments that were made in earlier panels, and to, uh, to the comments made earlier uh, by Arturo with respect to, you know, the, the risk profile is not the risk profile that's perceived. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's, let's bring this home with uh, uh, one leading question, but feel free to add uh, a closing comment with respect to what you'd like to see, uh, not just in your community, but in the broader Latino community with respect to access to capital. Um, question submitted is, how do you educate the younger generations to become an entrepreneur and to take on that risk uh, when it's embedded in the Latino family culture that debt is bad? I'll try to give it one. You want to take this one first? I'll start it off. All right. <laughs> That's a surprise. Yeah, it's a surprise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one, uh, one program that we're trying to target youth with is our youth venture program, where we really focus on mentorship through entrepreneurship. And we target high school up to sophomore and college age, but we're only getting younger and younger because okay. the education of what a loan is, what, what good debt is, yeah. right? That's not given in the K through 12 system. That's true. So we're trying to bolster those, those opportunities within those program models. Excellent, I love it. Now there's somebody I gotta introduce you to late, uh, later that does K through 12 uh, entrepreneurship education. I love that. Little plug for SDT. My closing comment will be let's keep connecting. This is powerful. You know, I would say it's education, right? Um, and it could either start from the business owner that is trying to pass the business to you know, their kids Mm -hmm. um, but it's showing them, right? Uh, sometimes we have to see it before we believe it. And saying, if you were to borrow for that additional piece of equipment, 
this is where you would be. You will be able to generate more sales, right? And it'll pay off um, to be able to not rent, but to actually buy your commercial building. You're building your balance sheet. You're building assets uh, that's gonna allow you to grow. So I think it's the education and showing them side by side, this is where you're at now and this is where you can be if you just take that challenge and be able to take that debt. Yeah, I, I see it as um, bringing good capital to our community. There's a reason why people would be averse to taking on debt when so much of it for us has been predatory, mm -hmm. right? So, so that's valid. It, the more good capital we bring into our community, that will dissipate. Excellent. And I would just say, I, this is just my own personal belief, it's not backed by science by any means, but I would think that the cultural drive to be an entrepreneur is stronger than the aversion to debt. Mm -hmm. That would be my, my personal opinion. And I think the current sort of young generation is so primed for entrepreneurship for so many reasons, including the pandemic, which has led to this you know, great resignation where people are just kind of going off and doing exactly what it is that they want to do. So I don't know, I'm not underestimating the, the challenge or sort of the, the cultural perception of debt, but I just think this moment in particular is ripe for entrepreneurship, particularly in this generation that we're talking about. Excellent. Please help me thank Marla, Arturo, Brian, and Teresa for the time today. Thank you.